Thanks everyone for coming today. Is that working? Good morning. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Melanie Ansbacher. I'm a pediatric hospitalist and director of the Global Health Curriculum here for our pediatric residents. And it's my pleasure today to introduce two faculty within our community who have not only had a career dedicated to training residents at our local institutions, but also are contributing to improving education of physicians in developing countries. Today's Grand Rounds is going to be given by Dr. Ellie Hamburger and Dr. Zori Talib. Uh, Dr. Hamburger is, a, many of you know, is a pediatrician at Children's Pediatrics Association in Foggy Bottom. She um, completed her residency here at Children's, and she previously served as the Associate Residency Program Director. She currently serves as the director of CAPE, which is the Children's Academy of Pediatric Educators. For four years, Dr. Hamburger served as the director of a partnership between um, GW and an NGO and the Eritrean Ministry of Health to support um, postgraduate medical educating, educational postgraduate post postgraduate medical training of pediatricians in the country of Eritrea. And she has also, I should mention, been a dedicated faculty mentor in the field of global health for many of our residents. Dr. Talib finished her residency training at George Washington University in internal medicine and currently serves as um, the associate program director of the GW internal medicine residency program. She has developed their community health elective and is now responsible for training in global health of their residents. She also serves as the project manager of the Remote Access for Health Professionals program, which works with a network of hospitals in East Africa to build capacity through remote and on-site support. Dr. Talib and Dr. Hamburger are here today because they are co-investigators in the Coordinating Center of the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, or MEPI. And MEPI is a program that supports institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa to develop or expand or enhance their medical education with the ultimate goals of building clinical and research capacity and um, retaining talented health professionals in those countries. Medical education in Sub-Saharan Africa has gotten a great deal of attention for its critical role in addressing healthcare workforce needs of the region. Today, Dr. Hamburger and Dr. Talib will describe the landscape of medical education in Sub-Saharan Africa the potential for a United States-Africa partnerships, and will highlight the recent and ongoing work housed at the GW School of Public Health and Department of Health Policy. So thank you very much for coming today. Okay, good morning everyone. Can you hear me okay? They muted me, but I insisted on being unmuted. So um, welcome. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about work that's going on in our backyard here uh, at GW. And just generally before we start, show of hands here. I know this is Global Health Week um, here at Children's. How many people here uh, have been involved in uh, global health work uh, at some point in their careers? Okay, keep your hands up, pretty much everybody here. And how many who haven't been have some interest or intention of doing so? Okay, um, so um, that uh, is a common theme um, for us here uh, throughout the United States in terms of interest. And what we'd like to do today is, briefly I'd like to go through with you the context for this interest in medical education and then um, in terms of the healthcare workforce issues in sub-Saharan Africa particularly, and the unmet healthcare needs. And then speak briefly about the evolution of the response to that both globally and in the United States. Um, the focus has shifted from health crisis intervention to looking at system strengthening. We'd like to uh, focus on particularly medical education in sub-Saharan Africa and its role in health system strengthening. And that's when we'll talk to you about this medical education partnership initiative that Zori and I are involved in. And finally, um, have a few points to make generally about U.S.-African partnerships. So um, 
the context, um, folks here I'm sure are familiar with the Millennium Development Goal. They were eight goals set by world leaders in the year 2000 to address inequities and issues having to do with uh, life in developing countries. The fourth goal um, is the uh, addressed reducing childhood mortality. And the goal by 2015 was that under five um, childhood mortality would, would be reduced by two thirds. This uh, pu study published in Lancet um, just a couple of weeks ago looked at ongoing trends and projected um, that the countries in blue would achieve that goal um, by the year 2015, but that particularly the countries that we're focusing on today in Sub-Saharan Africa, if con um, current trends continue, might not really achieve those goals until long after uh, the target date of 2015. Um, these maps may also be familiar to many of you, which sort of point out um, the maldistribution of, uh, here's the distribution of population in the world, the burden of disease, which is particularly heavy in the continent we're talking about today. And this study in, from Lancet in 2010 looked at well, where are the medical schools? Um, more than six per 10 million population in the light blue, less than two per 10 million population in the dark blue. And where are the healthcare workers? Again, um, less than 30 um, per 10 million population overall in the continent that we're talking about. The WHO in 2006, having been a major player in, uh, in establishing the goals in, two, in the year 2000, took a look at um, where we were getting with those and said one of the big uh, barriers to achieving the goals set out was the fact that there was a severe healthcare worker shortage. And they commissioned this study, Scaling Up Saving Lives, um, which produced a summary of recommendations for how medical education systems um, should morph themselves, adjust, and adapt so that they could be producing the doctors in numbers and quality that were needed. And a study in 2010 addressed specifically the issue of increasing access to health workers in remote and rural areas through improved retention. Again, a big focus on the role that medical education plays and how it needs to change to adapt to that role. These two studies, for those of you who are interested in reading more, uh, are well worth taking a look at. The U.S. response. So in 2003, um, Bush, um, President Bush commissioned the um, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, addressing specifically the high burden of HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the focus of this um, massive effort, which has really reaped remarkable results, was on care, prevention, care, and treatment of um, particularly folks with, a with people with HIV AIDS. Since that time, there's a growing recognition that rather than focusing on um, disease prevention and control, there really needs to be more of a broad focus on health systems strengthening. And last year, um, President Obama announced a commitment to that with the Global Health Initiative which really broadens the purpose and the uh, scope of American involvement uh, in, um, in healthcare issues in developing countries throughout the world. So it's a big initiative, $63 billion over six years uh, has been devoted to help partner countries with a dual purpose of improving health outcomes, but the new part of this is strengthening healthcare systems as well. There's a particular focus on the health of women, newborns, and children. And the idea also is that, um, that this is to be a country-led platform, that whereas before much of the aid was coming in and directed by outside countries, the focus here is really on putting the countries that have the issues that need to be addressed in the driver's seat and to create a sustainable delivery of essential health and care and public health programs. So PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, has, refo has refocused and 
Um, their um, human resources for health objectives include, as you can see in number one and number two here, a big focus on devoting um, efforts toward medical education. So if there is agreement, which there now is, that the medical education system in Africa is one that we need to focus on to address healthcare needs, what does that system look like now and uh, how can it be addressed? So um, this medical education pipeline I put up here, um, Zora developed this um, visual and one of the things I think that is um, most striking here is if you'll notice the green are, is that part of the pipeline that's dependent on government, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education policies. The gray um, is really the onus of the medical schools, so preclinical training, clinical training, and postgraduate medical education, and then there are areas that are dependent on both. So this is different from our system. Uh, in Africa, um, government policy really um, directs what comes into the pipeline, so the caliber of the students, the qualifications for the students, and then where they end up afterwards. These are um, post-colonial systems, so most of the medical school systems are based on um, British and French medical education um, systems, and um, uh, students go right from high school into medical school, and afterwards there's a rotating internship, and then um, many schools uh, require um, some sort of uh, clinical service in rural areas before students can come back and do postgraduate medical education. Uh, there was a recognition when uh, this has been highlighted in the last few years that we really, there was very little known about the landscape of medical education in Africa. And Gates, among other funders, um, was being approached by partner institutions throughout the world saying we'd like funding to work on this project that we have with this particular university. And they stepped back and said, look, to, before we start funding uh, any programs, we'd really like to understand more what is on the ground. And they commissioned um, this, the Sub-Saharan Africa Medical School Study, and uh, we brought a couple of copies in for the um, Global Health uh, Program. Um, we brought one for the library, so you'll have one here. Uh, this was a study that was um, the PIs in the study were at, GW, are, were at GW, Fitzhugh Mullen and Sebwe Frewat, who are the current PIs in the MEPI project. And the methodology used in this study was three-pronged. There was an exhaustive literature search done to see what was out there and what's been written about medical education in the region. The second part of it was, um, was done by a partner institution, the University of Pretoria, um, which was a survey, an exhaustive survey of the medical schools in the, on the continent. And the third part was um, 10 targeted site visits to schools in the region. And um, I went on two of those, one to Walter Sisulu in, um, uh, in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, and the other, uh, which was a school started during apartheid uh, for black students by black faculty, and the other, um, Makarere, one of the oldest schools in sub-Saharan Africa in Uganda. And um, the findings from these studies were uh, surprised people. Uh, in fact, the update on this is there are 171 medical schools in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some of them, um, Nigeria, Sudan, have as many as 25 to 29 schools, and Namibia, Mauritania have none, and there's a range in between. Um, the other striking thing is that most schools were started after the era of African countries gaining independence. And before then, there were very, very few schools that admitted African students. Um, so there's been an enormous growth, and most strikingly, in the last 10 years, um, an exponential growth in numbers of schools. These colors depict private, um, nonprofit, nonprofit faith-based or for-profit, so there's a big increase in private medical schools. Um, we know about the brain drain. Um, schools were asked five years after graduation what proportion 
of your domestic graduates have migrated out of your country. And the estimate was um, about 30% um, in countries, um, English, Anglophone countries, Francophone, um, and Portuguese, Lusophone countries. Uh, one other striking finding was the problem of faculty retention, retention and recruitment. So not only is there the external brain drain that we see with graduates um, from the medical school, but also there's a pretty big problem with internal brain drain. So faculty are not paid very good salaries by the, med by the ministries for um, working in the medical schools. But so many are migrating to local non-governmental organizations, um, private practice, and ironically, even to government, government that is ministry jobs, um, leaving medical school posts to do that. So, um, so the SAM study really pointed out these major challenges um, to the medical schools. And I want you to keep this in mind because we're going to ask you to do a little active thinking in a few minutes. Um, the, the major um, problems really um, focused on this issue of faculty recruitment and retention for the schools. There are issues with infrastructure um, and um, particularly um, electronic. And, um, and the issue that I pointed out that's more in government hands of student recruitment and then postgraduate placement is a big one if medical schools want to focus on addressing issues, um, regionally important issues. Uh, the SAM study also looked at who African schools are partnering with. And you can see that um, Europe um, makes up the largest bulk of this, but North America not far behind. So Canada and the United States have a big presence there. But primarily that presence has been in partnerships surrounding research and not medical education per se to date. Um, part of the SAM study um, also, as I mentioned, did this exhaustive literature review. And what the um, article that was published in Medical Teacher last month um, highlights is that um, there's a real dearth of information about the medical education system and including a description and analysis of technology, um, financing for medical education, how the medical education system is scaling up uh, human resources for health, and what the outcomes of postgraduate training and primary care training are. So there's a lot of room out there for study. Um, when the SAMS uh, study was published um, last March in The Lancet, an accompanying editorial focused on this project we're about to describe to you, MEPI, the Medical Education Partnerships Initiative and pointed out that um, MEPI's main funding comes from this new initiative found, um, housed in PEPFAR, which um, aims to turn medical education in sub-Saharan Africa around, starting with deploying $130 million in grants to US schools in the region. And we're going to be describing those to you. To encourage more graduates to stay where needed, MEPI schools will use a combination of factors, including community-based education, early exposure to rural practice, creation of clear career paths, and support for regionally relevant research. So um, this funding came through. Um, school, 13 schools have been awarded about $10 million over five years. And the goals of the project are to look at how medical education, what innovations in medical education address these goals. Uh, increasing the numbers and quality of healthcare workers trained, retaining those healthcare workers over time and in areas where they're most needed, um, and uh, improving capacity to conduct regionally relevant research. So up to now, much of the research being done on the continent is has been driven by external partners. And this is, so the researchers themselves were not the faculty in the African schools or the PIs weren't at any way. So these are the schools um, that were funded. You can see most of them are in East Africa, um, with the exception of Nigeria and, um, and Ghana in West Africa. And um, the um, coordinating center um, grant was awarded to George Washington University. As I mentioned earlier, the PIs on that are um, Sebley Freywad and Fitzhugh Mullen who um, were in the um, were in the SAMS uh, led the SAMS study 
And with them is um, the partner institution in Africa, HS, the African Center for Global Health and Social Transformation. And Francis Omaswa, a former cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, leads HS. Um, the, the effort is also um, joined by um, faculty in the coordinating center at HS. And these are amazing medical educators who we um, got to know in the course of doing the SAM study. And I just want to introduce them to you a bit so you have a feeling for who's involved in this work. Um, so um, Shade knows um, Bumi Olapade, um, who trained with her in uh, Nigeria uh, in Ibadan. And he has led an effort to um, and has successfully revamped the curriculum at Ibadan, one of the oldest schools in Africa to ha have more of a competency-based and systems-based focus. Um, Dia is from Sudan, where there's um, a uh, remarkable system of com community-based education. Uh, Jehu Kuto is from Walter Suzulu, the school that I mentioned to you earlier, where they've done groundbreaking work in recruiting students from rural areas and bringing them up to speed um, and um, introduced um, problem-based learning to the continent, basically. Um, uh, and uh, Abraham, who works in uh, Jimmy University in Ethiopia, again, a big community-based focus. Elsie Chiguli Malwade works with Francis Omaswa uh, at HS um, and has a degree in, uh, an advanced degree in medical education. Kumaria is um, the leader of uh, Francophone countries in medical education. and. Um, Rugi and Mapatsa there are from um, Tanzania and uh, Malawi. Um, Rugi is a dentist by training who is the dean at a private medical school, small private medical school in Dar es Salaam. And Mapatsa um, was key in getting a research support center started uh, in Malawi, which is a, um, a gem and a, a model for the rest of the schools in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the role of the coordinating center briefly has been um, threefold to evaluate and monitor the progress that the schools are making. And um, we did that in this first year um, by sending out a survey to get baseline, helping schools develop logic models. But the main thing was really getting out and doing site visits to see what was going on on the ground at the schools. Um, the coordinating center is responsible for helping networking among the schools and for promoting education through a website. Pictured here is Zori with Leticia. Um, who is one of, the, um, one of the leaders of the project at the NIH. So the funding for the project comes primarily from NIH and HRSA. Um, so we're going to take a little break here um, and give you a minute to sort of think about this. So you've got a sense of what the landscape is. And now you are the dean. And here's your task. Uh, you have great difficulty attracting and retaining faculty. The Ministry of Health needs more doctors in rural areas, and most of your graduates, as we've described, practice or get government jobs in the immediate urban area. Some go on to postgraduate training programs in your institution after their requisite rural service. Your challenge, the Ministry of Education is requiring that you double the number of medical students uh, next year um, who you're admitting to your school. And along comes this RFA. Um, $10 million over five years, uh, and you have a partner, a US partner, who's been on your medical school campus for a long time doing HIV AIDS research, who stepped forward to help apply for this grant, but has thus far not been involved in medical education. And here's your challenge. How do you propose to use the money? So before we describe to you what the MEPI schools are doing with the money that they've been awarded, we wanted to give you a chance to think about how you would spend the money if it were um, provided to you. So we're going to have you take a minute to confer with your associate deans to your right and to your left. Um, this is actually a real dean. <laughs> uh, that is uh, Marion Jacobs from the University of Cape Town uh, with Boomi, who I showed you before, and Ryan Grayson, who did the literature search for SAMS. So take a couple minutes and just think about this. Uh, turn to uh, your associate deans to your right and left and confer. What would you do? given this landscape with the money that you've been provided, that is dangled in front of you. Take a couple minutes.
All right. Address that during the questions. I think so. Yeah. Can we move to the next slide? I can't remember the next slide. Yet. Okay. No. no. Okay. Are you? Are you? All right. I'm going to interrupt to ask to see what how your discussions have gone. <coughs> Everyone's deep in conversation. All right. I'm going to get back to the talk, and I want to hear what your thoughts are. So you've been given ten million dollars to re to improve or invest in your medical education institution. And we'll go through a show of hands. If we were to clump investments into either curriculum, resources, physical, electronic, or faculty, show of hands, how many decided or thought that they would invest in some form in their curriculum? A few. A few more over here. What about resources? Physical infrastructure, electronic resources, textbooks? So a few more hands. About faculty, increasing numbers or quality. So more hands there. All right. Well, interesting to, to reflect on this as we now look to see what the Matthew schools chose to do. Is it known why the faculty leave? So one of the slides that Ellie showed before demonstrated that there's there's the external brain drain, but really there's an in-country brain drain that faculty, because of the quality, because of the work environment in the academic institutions, they have less resources. The pay is not great, which is a really critical factor. They tend to go to the NGOs who pay better. They tend to go to government ministry jobs, etc. So it's really the quality of their work environment and salaries that drains faculty. Um, and, and there's there's a push and a pull. There's there's really no limited attraction to the academic environment right now. We'll talk about this because we're going to talk a bit about faculty development in Africa. So if you think about medical training here, this is where our MEPI schools chose to invest. All of them, in some form, chose to invest in all three categories. So if we look at just curriculum and break it down into either investing in the content of the curriculum or the delivery of the of the curriculum. A good number chose to look at content, which means, and again, we're going to go through these a little more, they either want to look at the competencies their curriculum is teaching or introduce new curricula in new um, subject matters. All 13 of them decided they were going to address some form of delivery of their curriculum. And really, for to two ends, some of them chose to introduce or expand PBL or community-based education because they want to teach new competencies. They want to teach leadership and management skills, communication skills. But a good number of them wanted to use e-learning, skills lab, and team-based learning really to be able to teach more with less. If we think about faculty, almost all of them are addressing discreetly numbers, but really all of them are looking at improving quality. So if you think about faculty development, they've all said in some way, shape, or form that they want to improve the quality of teaching that's being done at these institutions, but really to recruit and retain faculty at their institutions. And looking at what kind of resources these programs are going to invest in, some of them are investing in textbooks, libraries. All of them are going to invest in some way in technology. Um, and some of them are investing in physical infrastructure. This next slide is similar. It's, a, it's bar graphs of similar. But what, what's different on this graph um, is the additional representation of the research investments. So MEPI has three themes, improving quality and quantity of physicians trained, getting them to where they're needed. But the third anchor of MEPI is improving research capacity. And so all of the MEPI schools are investing in research capacity building through providing training to the faculty, the students, the residents 
by providing seed funding to students and faculty who are interested, and by twinning faculty and residents with their US partners to provide mentoring and a heavy investment in research capacity building is going into establishing research support structures, so establishing a grants management system, IRBs, et cetera. So if we look at just, if you look at the curriculum investment now, where are they investing? In the undergraduate, in the residency training, or in the master's level? A good emphasis is on the undergraduate, and that's primarily because it's imposed upon these institutions, many of them, that they need to double or triple their numbers. So one example is in Ethiopia, where the current ratio is two physicians to 100,000 people compared to 270 in the US. So dramatic shortage of physicians in Ethiopia. And the government there has chosen to flood the market. They're going to train 20,000 doctors by 2020. And how are they going to do that? With the same, with the current medical schools and increasing the schools. <clears throat> so at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, where the entering class previously had about 100 students just a few years ago, this year they're admitting 400 students. So in three years, they've really dramatically increased the number of students, and it's just dropped upon them. So they are almost exclusively investing in their undergraduate training program, trying to teach more with less and maintain some quality in the face of a rapid and massive scale-up. Other schools are focusing on other schools are focusing on graduate training, <clears throat> where we just acknowledge that a lot of graduates leave the country for residency training opportunities abroad. So Mozambique, for example, is spending their MEPI investment on establishing an internal medicine residency program in country. And the master's level courses, <coughs> excuse me, are like are the basic sciences. So one of the biggest uh, deficits in the country, or in the continent rather, is basic science faculty to teach in these undergraduate um, in these undergraduate programs, especially in the rural areas or rural training schools. So, so, so a lot of schools are establishing master's level training programs to be able to train their own faculty for their medical schools. So if we look at what, what, what is the content of the new curriculum and the revisions of the curriculum that they are investing in, there's at all three levels the bolded uh, topics are those that where efforts are focused, and a number of them are looking at their general curriculum and revising the competencies, re uh, competencies across the curriculum. Of note and of interest here is that, interestingly, emergency medicine is something that's cropping up across Africa, so both at the undergraduate level and at the, ma at the residency level. So community-based education is an area of focus for MEPI schools for a number of reasons. One of them is because it provides additional training sites for the increased number of students that are coming through. And the other important reason why the schools are investing in community-based education is, it because, is because it's a retention strategy. They've sh some of the studies have shown, and the WHO has published, that if you train students in the community, they're comfortable working in that environment, they're more likely to choose to work there once they graduate. So our schools, about seven of them have chosen to invest in CBE, and they're going to increase the number of sites, provide faculty training, and, and, and um, create or develop their curriculum further. So a case study of Makere University, which, as Ellie mentioned, is one of the oldest institutions in Africa. It, it went through some downtime after Idi Amin, after Idi Amin came along, and has since had at that time the infrastructure and the faculty um, went downhill, but now with strong leadership, this university is coming up again. And what they have done with their MEPI funds is extraordinary because they have brought all of their medical schools in country into a consortium, so they're all working together. And all throughout the country, there's a commitment to community-based education. So all five of the schools, which even include one private institution, are investing in CBE. They're going to track their CBE programs, monitor them, and evaluate the outcomes. And what's really neat about Makere, about, about the Uganda um, MEPI Award is that all of their community-based education programs are different. They go out in different years, they train for different lengths of time. Even what they teach in the community is different. Some focus on research, others focus on management skills. So there's a learning lab just within Uganda that MEPI hopes to sort of track over time. This is a picture of our visit, our site visit to Makere. 
um, this is the community hospital, Kayunga District Hospital, a bustling place in the district where um, patients come for acute care, but they also get some preventative care. This is an antenatal class there. And this is the dean of the private medical uh, school there, Kampala International University. And this is actually a PI from another school. So one of the things that's lacking in Africa is a, is a network among medical educators in the region. So what we've done on our site visits is taking PIs from other programs on site visits. So this was a site visit to Uganda, and the PI from Nairobi came along. So the networking starts there. And coming back to the fact that Uganda is really a pioneer and a leader in community-based education and has really already published a lot of what they've been doing and seeing in the community. What is the impact on the community? What is the impact on the students? They've started doing surveys and publishing their results. This is another picture from Makere. This is actually from Ellie's site visit, and this was a nurse who supervises students while they're out there in one of the reports that the students um, put together. And this is the hostel, the living conditions, that are the hostel for the accommodation for the students when they are out there. And, and this slide is to ask, what are the questions remaining? Community-based education is done worldwide, whether it's in Africa, India, or in the US. But in particular in Africa, there are a number of questions that we're hoping that MEPI will, will shed some light on, but really are opportunities for US partners to work with African partners um, to explore. What are the models of CBE that work? How can we use technology to improve the experiences in the, C in, in the community? How can students and faculty access resources when they're in the community? And one of the biggest challenges of these CBE programs is preceptors, recruiting them, training them, incentivizing them. So what are the strategies that are being employed? What works? And, and last, but of course most importantly, not least, is the is impact. What is the impact of these CBE programs on students? Does it really lead to retention in, in country, which is really what's needed? So now looking at the other category of faculty development, and all of our schools decided they were going to invest in faculty development. They're going to teach their faculty how to teach different methods of teaching. They're going to teach how to develop curricula. They're going to train residents how to teach, because that provides a whole new group of, of potential teachers for their program. And they are, suggest, they are planning to do this through workshops, twinning programs, and a number of them are going to establish a medical education department to provide a home for the medical educators in these environments who traditionally, as we all know, medical educators have not been rewarded for their educational activities. So they haven't been promoted if you're an educator all your life. So these medical education departments that are cropping up in Africa are to provide training for faculty, but also to advocate for career paths in medical education and for dissemination of medical education innovations. So another case study is the University of Zimbabwe, which is one of our MEPI schools. And um, James Hakim is the PI here, who is a remarkable individual in himself. He, Zimbabwe is one of these institutions that was really doing really well before the 80s and then just plummeted downhill. All the bright faculty left. All of the physical infrastructure was ignored. And he stayed through this exodus and has remained there in a leadership position, is now trying to bring things back up. Uh, the partner for Zimbabwe is Stanford, but another partner they've engaged is Famer. So Famer is the Foundation for Advancement of International Medical Education and Research. It's an arm of the ECFMG and provides training and networking opportunities for medical educators. So what they've done traditionally is brought faculty from Africa and from different parts of the world to Philadelphia for a fellowship program, and then they send them back into their, into their um, countries. And they've had a remarkable track record of training 600 fellows who go back to their programs, get promoted, and stay at their institutions to promote medical education. So FAMER has expanded that model to create regional sites in South Africa, India, and Brazil. And now through MEPI, they're, they're exploring a new model of creating centers of excellence in schools. So the University of Zimbabwe will train four fellows in FAMER, and then those four fellows will train over 40, fel 40 faculty over the course of the MEPI timeframe. So an innovation in faculty development where they're using expertise from the West and really building capacity locally. And finally, looking at where, where um, the schools are investing in resources and focusing on technology. So 
in this regard, technology for these schools sort of runs the gamut. A lot of them are investing in internet-based programs and resources. But on the other hand, everybody has a cell phone. And internet is hit or miss. You know, Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, you can find internet there. But if you start going to some of the smaller centers like Moshi, I guess maybe Moshi is not a good example, but some of the more remote sites, internet is, is hit or miss. So the mobile phone is going to become something that's really um, innovative and can really bring access to the remote sites. A few of the schools are going to develop M learning platforms. A lot of them are going to build programs based on the internet. And some of them are just using low tech. We're just video conferencing a lecture because if you have to teach 400 students and give a lecture four times, you may as well videotape it and, and, and provide it remotely that way. So breaking down how they're investing in technology, some of them are investing in physical infrastructure, establishing an intranet on campus so that even if the internet goes down, even if they don't have access that way, they can provide digital libraries and a learning management system on campus. Others are investing in the electronic tools, the LMS, the digital library, and some are investing in, in tablets, and I'm going to talk about an example of that here. So the, the last case study is of KCMC, which is Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, which is a school in Moshi, Tanzania, in, in a beautiful setting near Mount Kilimanjaro. So this school has also been, has the challenge of training a lot more students in a short frame of time, faces similar challenges of faculty. It's hard to get faculty to come out to work in Moshi, and continent-wide there really isn't many, aren't many faculty to even recruit from right now. So what they've done is, is two really innovative things. First of all, they've sort of souped up their campus. They are connected. They're connected to the internet, but they have power outages. So they have that additional challenge of, yes, we have access to the internet, but it's not consistent because of the power outages. And they have the faculty shortages. So two things that they're going to do. One is they're, they are going to give all faculty and students a tablet, a Zoom tablet, which will provide them offline access to educational resources so that both students and faculty can access that. And they are going to, their partner is Duke University, who's a leader in team-based learning. And, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with team-based learning, which is a model where students work in teams, not with a faculty for each team, but one or two preceptors for a room full of teams. And so it's an efficient way, again, to teach more with less. So their plans are to implement a team-based learning curriculum at KCMC. And these pic this picture, this is um, the PI from, from Moshi. His name is Moshi, so he's Moshi from Moshi. Um, and this is a picture of their classroom. So they have very nice facilities, and as they were, as they were um, building these facilities, the students thought, well, if we're going to be working in teams, we may as well color code the classroom so the teams can sit together. But then they went to Duke and realized, well, that's not really how team-based learning works. So this is a floor plan of how they actually were able to um, intervene in time to make, to create the physical space that's conducive to team-based learning. So I think this is going to be one of those schools that's very interesting to follow over time because they're being innovative about how they're using technology and how they're using a, a novel way of curriculum del delivery to teach more with less um, and in the face of faculty shortages. So with that, I'm going to ask Ellie to come back and finish up. Uh, so we just want to wrap up and allow some time for discussion and questions. Uh, I think what we've learned over the course of these last couple of years with the SAM study and now our first year in MEPI is um, we've gotten some sense of what partnerships can achieve. So partnerships between um, particularly us, U.S. Um, medical schools and medical centers and African schools. One of the striking things is bringing in an outside partner to talk about medical education is a catalyst in itself. Um, having someone, I think we've, many of us have had this experience, someone with um, another set of eyes comes in and looks at your program and, um, and funding comes in and there's a catalytic effect, not just the things that were planned that, in the, that were written in these RFAs are happening at these schools, but other departments, other schools have gotten, other uh, schools in countries have gotten involved in this effort. Um, and also, it takes effort to write up what you're doing, to study it, and to disseminate it. And partners can really um, be a help in that regard as well. 
consultation on medical education strategies. We introduced you some great medical educators in Africa, but um, as we also described, there's a dearth of faculty there. So getting some help with medical education strategies is important and modeling clinical teaching. Um, uh, as the paradigm shifts there, as it has here, with looking at competency and teaching in a different way in the clinical setting, um, there's an opportunity for partners to come in and help with that. Um, a big issue um, with this focus on teaching in the community has to do with teaching health systems research and providing training on that is something else that partners can provide. And of course, um, the exchange of ideas, perspectives, and approaches as well. So with that, um, we want to pause. Uh, and um, time for some um, questions and discussion. George. Uh, my question is, uh, how about uh, lesser trained health workers that have been in the communities for a long time and getting them more education, it certainly is a much less expensive proposition if you can have uh, people who are like the native health workers that are in many of these countries and are overwhelmed and give them a little bit more backup and more training. You're absolutely right. That's a great point. So there's, a, uh, there's also an effort to study the issue of task shifting. So um, what can lesser trained workers do um, uh, to provide one of the um, so-called links awards to this in Mozambique is looking at um, technicos in Mozambique. Um, so those are lesser trained people who haven't gone through medical school who do surgery in the periphery. And looking, um, there's a study to look at what they can do and what they can't do and um, how to fill in. There's also a parallel pro program that PEPFAR has funded called NEPI, um, Nursing Education Partnership Initiative, um, that's focusing on that. So that's not an area that's gone neglected. Um, our focus has been on medical education, but the other areas are being addressed as well. Any other comments or questions? I think there was one from... Yes, there is one more question from Dr. Paulson on WebEx. And the question is, if you can address the growth of for-profit medical schools, in sub-Saharan Africa, and how do you think this will alter education outcomes and faculty distribution? So um, this phenomenon that the SAM study uncovered that there are for-profit schools developing in Africa is one, they, it's a question that's still out there. Um, uh, Jerry's question is a good one. It's really not clear how what impact that's going to have. KCMC, Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center that um, Zori um, mentioned is a faith-based private institution. So there's some funding coming in from the Lutheran Church, but students have to pay more for tuition there than they do in the publicly funded schools. So that one is not for profit, but it still is one where students have to pay more. And of course, there's an increased burden. So the students who have um, some access to resources um, will come in um, into the system. The flooding um, that Zori mentioned in Ethiopia brings in students of, um, of different caliber, perhaps, than we're, than we're coming in before. So that also needs to be looked at. And thus far, um, the students who have come into the system, into the medical school systems, have come in by having the highest grades on science exams. So there aren't interviews. Um, there thus far hasn't really been a focus on what qualities um, does it take in an entering medical student to assure or to at least make the promise of their staying in country and serving in areas um, more likely? Walter Suzulu is a school where they've done some, um, some work in recruiting students from less privileged areas and spending the first semester of medical school bringing their English language schools up to because um, they all speak COSA, which I can't do the click for, but COSA. Um, and, um, and so they, they've addressed that issue, but most schools haven't. So they. Thank you, Ellie. What a beautiful representation of um, what's going on over there. Um, and 
you and I have talked about this. Um, I'm very, very impressed and very um, appreciative of you representing what is a very complex system in less than an hour. Um, and I can assure you that I will give feedback to my friends who you, you've worked with uh, that you did a very good representation of what they're doing. Thank you very much. I have a few comments. Um, one of which uh, you just talked about uh, as a product of this, this system that you described. Uh, many of us, uh, I can't speak much for the Francophone, uh, for the French speaking countries, but those of us who were British colonized countries have a very British system, uh, were, were trained in a very British system from elementary school right through postgraduate training. So it, it's it's not as simple a system as saying, um, you know, you, the, the whole education system goes through um, exam and elimination with a focus on going to professional um, training being, you know, by exams and elimination, which was mostly government controlled. Um, that system is very different from what any one of you have experienced here. So the interviewing system is not germane to that. Um, but it's kind of entrained in, in a sense because exams are more, um, some of the exams are oral exams, um, which gives you face-to-face -face interactions and also helps to uh, um, evaluate your skills which are not just in, which are not seen in the written exams. And many of the written exams are um, uh, negative uh, marking. So you lose, lose points for uh, your, your wrong answers, you know, which, uh, which gives us a closed marking system. Medical school for me was uh, led up to, uh, you know, a point where part of your training is that national service, which you talked about or which you mentioned. That was supposed to give back to the community. That's where doctors went into the rural community to, fought to, you know, as manpower, that you get a stipend. It's like the Peace Corps system, where every, everyone who the government has invested in your medical or your education right from elementary school gives back to the system. In the 60s and in the 70s, when things started going south, especially in Nigeria, most people who were products of that system were with, you know, with governments changing, with uh, uh, the army takeover in many countries, uh, that system got eroded. And that's where the brain drain actually started. So um, it's that community service that is really has been more or less eroded or eliminated that, that creates this, this gap where people are not used to going back into the community to serve um, because um, the system has been eroded. The other part of that is, as you probably have found out, is that there are many ethnic differences throughout the continent. Africa is not one big country. You know? <laughs> so, um, and in Nigeria, we have 250 different dialects. We don't speak the same language. We don't have the same culture. And you would find that even the medical schools that you, you can see are influenced by the ethnicity of the location. Um, I, you know, I, I give this example. I, in my medical school, my father's actually established a, um, what's called the Barakwa Project, which I don't know if you've heard about, but it was fashioned after the public health system at, of Johns Hopkins in the 60s. And I had a medical student who wrote my father to come to that project. It's a rural uh, um, um, setting where you go for six weeks, you, you're in the community, and you, do, you have to come out with a project as part of your medical school training. She came from Mount Sinai in New York, and she wanted to do a project on hypertension. That was not the project that my group was going to going for. But you know, when she wrote my father, he said, "Well, my daughter is in medical school. You can go to that." You can come down and you know be with her so that you you know you have some um, um, someone you know who you know and it really created a rift between our, the whole group who were given a different project from our school uh, and what she was expected to bring back from her elective training. Um, I use that example to say that coming into the community system, 
understanding the ethnicities and the problems that the medical schools are faced with, first by regulation from the government, and then what the medical school curricula are, all system and British curricula that were established, um, is something that you know I, I really applaud you for going in to first evaluate and help to develop a medical education system that you know um, is going to be that, that that integrates actually two systems: the American coming to help uh, a system that is is old and. Um, so thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Shade. And I hope that um, that will inspire more people, more especially our residents, uh, who want to go be part of the global initiative uh, to help us. Thanks. You know, I should mention one other uh, thing very briefly. Um, Mary Olini and I just um, did a trip to Abu Dhabi um, to look at how we could help um, in the medical system, education system there. And it was interesting how many parallels there are, although the issue of resources is a completely different one, of course. Um, the, uh, it, the, the system is very young because uh, the resources um, uh, that have come into play there uh, have really only been in, come in in the last 20 years. So many of the issues that are being faced there in terms of medical education and the needs aren't so different, um, surprisingly, from um, from the issues that these countries are facing in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's an interesting um, new face for us to look at um, as medical educators. So thank you all very much for your attention today.